historical literature, uh, morphine was used more often. And then even uh, remifentanil, which we don't have here. Uh, maybe in the future we can look into using remifentanil, but we primarily use these three different agents. And some of the non-opioid analgesics you'll see in your practice are ketamine, certain NSAIDs, ketorolac, ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen, gabapentin, and there are others uh, depending on how far you want to go with some of the non-opioid analgesics. But remembering that in ICU patients, you really are going to have, especially for the mechanically ventilated adults, have to have an opioid on to treat their pain. The going over the three main opioid analgesics and also including methadone in there because methadone does pop up every once in a while. I just wanted to kind of give you a comparison of some of these drugs. So fentanyl is very potent. It has 100 times the potency of morphine. It's highly lipophilic and it's also metabolized in the liver. Uh, it does have renal elimination, but doesn't really require any renal adjustment. And the great thing about fentanyl is there's no active metabolites has a relatively short half-life, very quick on and offset. So fentanyl has primarily become the agent of choice, at least in our ICU and at many ICUs around the country. When I worked at Tampa General Hospital and uh, Wake Forest in North Carolina, fentanyl was sort of their go-to uh, analgesic as well in the ICU. Hydromorphone is a, a good option as well. It uh, is gonna have um, similar properties to fentanyl with the exception that it is not metabolized via the SIP system, but undergoes glucuronidation. It does have renal elimination as well, but again, both fentanyl and hydromorphone are not really drugs that I'm thinking about adjusting for either renal or hepatic impairment so much. There's no active metabolites, and it has a relatively short half-life as well. The duration of action is, is very similar uh, to morphine, getting about three to four hours of analgesia. And morphine used to be considered the uh, gold standard kind of opioid, and now that we have newer options, it's not used quite as much. Uh, it's relatively actually hydrophilic, and so it has a slower onset, relatively uh, less titratable. And the big thing with morphine that we have to remember is that it does have active metabolites, and those active metabolites will accumulate in renal impairment. And then lastly, I just have methadone on here because it does pop up, especially in our uh, opioid abuse population every once in a while. It's not something that you're going to go to uh, as a first line option. It is go going to go through the liver and uh, has cytochrome P450 metabolism, as well as renal elimination, and it has a very long half-life. So it's not something that we're going to typically jump to first line, but it is an option that may pop up, uh, especially for your uh, drug abuse population and having to uh, transition them to methadone. I've also just included a quick reference slide for you guys regarding dosing. Uh, dosing, you'll see different recommendations, whether you're looking on Lexicomp, Micromedics, different textbooks, or even what we commonly do here at Cabell. Uh, you're gonna have weight-based dosing as well as sort of the fixed dose approach. We do uh, a fixed dose approach here, and I don't really think in adults from the literature that I've reviewed, there's been really any difference between weight-based and the fixed dosing, especially as our population's obese, probably doing a fixed dosing prevents us from overdosing those patients. But as I mentioned just a little bit on the prior slide about the onset and the duration of effects, this is probably the most important information for you guys to know is that fentanyl is gonna have a very quick onset, one to two minutes, and then the duration of effect is only about 30 to 60 minutes. Whereas if you're thinking about hydromorphone or morphine, it's a little bit slower of an onset, and then a longer duration of effect as well. I have some equi analgesic dosing at the bottom. So if you're ever trying to convert a patient from one opioid to another, this is some rough sort of equivalencies that you can get. It's important to know though, if you're changing between opioids that typically you're not gonna do a one-to-one, -one, like 100% switch to whatever the equivalent dose is, there is going to be uh, a dose reduction that needs to occur in most patients. But this is a general, uh, sort of equivalency that you guys can remember. With fentanyl, 100 micrograms, hydromorphone 1.5 milligrams equals morphine of 10 milligrams. And that, that serves as a guidance, but remember you may have to reduce that dose in some patients, especially if they're not on mechanical ventilation. So just a summary of the opioids and their pharmacology. Remember that morphine is going to have the slowest on, slowest off, it's the least preferred in patients with renal impairment. You can still use it, but just remember to be cautious with its use. And it does have some histamine release and hemodynamic effects that are probably a little bit greater than some of the other opioids. Hydromorphone has a similar kinetic uh, profile to morphine. 
but it's going to be a drug of choice in either renal or hepatic failure. And oftentimes when I'm turning to hydromorphone is when we've had a patient on fentanyl for quite some time and they develop a tolerance to fentanyl, sometimes changing the opioid itself will uh, help that patient uh, become comfortable and have their pain controlled just by changing the opioid that you use. Fentanyl again has a quick on, a quick off. Uh, there are some potential for drug interactions, but because fentanyl is so short acting, these are really not all that uh, clinically significant. It's a good option in real impairment. And while there, again, may be some accumulation in hepatic impairment because the half-life is so short, it's usually not all that clinically relevant. There are also some adjunctive analgesics. Uh, I didn't want to go through these in too much detail, but just wanted to kind of give you a reference. And I'll send these slides out at some point after the lecture so you guys can have this, just again for your reference. But I did want to kind of summarize some of the pharmacology of these different agents. Um, with acetaminophen, again, the, the important thing to remember that I'll, I'll call out about this one is that it does have a toxic metabolite. And especially in our patients with hepatic impairment, this is one you want to use caution in. And for your liver patients, not go any higher than two grams a day. Ketamine has come in uh, to recent use and recent interest in a lot of different populations. It's primarily a, a NMDA antagonist. And the big thing to know about ketamine is um, some of the emergence reactions that you can get from that. And then certain populations that you don't want to use it in because it can raise your blood pressure as well as your heart rate. And so ketamine is not going to be a good option if you have someone with an only going in STEMI or some kind of cardiac ischemia. There are others on this slide. For the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, skip past these. We're not really using a lot of lidocaine in the ICU for pain. The guidelines mention them, and most of the data is going to be postoperatively uh, for lidocaine, uh, using that as a continuous infusion for pain. The guidelines recommend not routinely using it in most patients. Couturil also is an NSAID, while it's great for musculoskeletal pain, and a lot of your medical ICU patients and the pulmonology patients that you'll be seeing, uh, these patients have renal issues, they have blood pressure issues, they have uh, GI bleed histories, so NSAIDs are usually going to be avoided in, in those types of patients. And then for neuropathic pain, you have options like gabapentin, carbamazepine, these are different options. A gabapentin is a much cleaner agent as it's only renally eliminated, and you just have to be careful in patients with renal impairment, whereas carbamazepine has a lot of different adverse effects. It goes through the liver, and it has a very long half-life. So I, I've not seen a lot of physicians adopting carbamazepine for any neuropathic pain. Most providers are, are that I've seen are going to gabapentin or pregabalin, although both are recommended for neuropathic pain within the guidelines. Again, this is just sort of for your reference, some of the dosing of these adjunctive analgesics. Uh, as we're trying to be comprehensive here, I wanted to have that for your reference, but we won't go through the dosing of each one of these agents. If you have more questions about any of that, uh, please stop me and we'll come back to it. So that's a whirlwind tour of the pharmacology of analgesia, and now we'll get into sedation. And if you remember that first slide that we talked about with the guidelines recommending a now go sedation. So that's really, uh, you can think of it like this, using analgesia first sedation. Uh, and it is guideline recommended. It's associated with uh, increased ventilator free days, shorter ICU length of stays. And these are all things that we want. We want patients to get off the vent, avoid the complications of having uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, uh, delirium, weakness, all the things that are associated with staying in the ICU for longer periods of time. So if we can use our sedative, or sorry, excuse me, if we can use our opioid, our analgesic agent, provide sedation before we even add on propofol or midazolam or Presidex, you know, that may be the best option. And that's where the guidelines are hinting to use analgo sedation. But once you get beyond that analgesia, maybe you maximize their pain control and the patient's still uncomfortable. At that point, it's reasonable to start a sedative. And that falls into that stepwise approach, treating pain first and then following that up with a sedation. The three commonly used classes of sedatives that we have at least are benzodiazepines with midazolam, lorazepam, and sometimes diazepam being used as the common agents, dexmedetomidine, and then propofol. There are alternative sedatives, but I do want to emphasize that word alternative. There's not a lot of good data for these. Uh, ketamine, phenobarbital, valproic acid even. I've seen studies for these things, case reports, uh, but these are again going to be more or less alternative sedatives when you've maximized everything that you're on and you really have no other options, these may be agents that you have to turn to.
So looking at some of the characteristics of our sedatives briefly, uh, the two main benzodiazepines that we're using in the ICU are going to be midazolam and lorazepam. And the big difference between the two of these is they both go through the liver. They both are GABA-A receptor agonists. But lorazepam it goes through glucuronidation where midazolam is cytochrome P450 metabolized. And the reason that's relevant clinically is if you have a patient with cirrhosis, lorazepam is going to be an option that does not accumulate to the degree that midazolam does. Midazolam also has active metabolites, whereas lorazepam does not. So again, if you have someone with hepatic impairment or renal impairment, midazolam is going to stay on much longer. The other thing that you might need to know about lorazepam or Ativan is that IV product of lorazepam is in propylene glycol. And if you're using high doses for a long period of time, you can get propylene glycol toxicity. We'll talk about that on a future slide. Going down to propofol and dexmedetomidine, these are our primary two agents that we're using over and above the benzodiazepines due to the benzodiazepines association with delirium. But propofol is also a GABA-A agonist and works at other receptor sites. It does go through hepatic metabolism, but you, honestly, you don't really see accumulation with it due to its extra hepatic metabolism. It is renally eliminated, but again, propofol is not going to be accumulating based on organ dysfunction so much as a uh, patient's adipose tissue and how long you've been using and what dose. If you use propofol at high doses for a long period of time in an obese patient, it can accumulate in the adipose tissue. And although we normally think of propofol as a quick on, quick off agent, the half-life can be extremely variable depending on the dose, the weight of the patient, and how long they've been on the drug. Next, looking at dexmedetomidine as an alpha-2 agonist. This inhibits the sympathetic outflow from the CNS and can calm the patient, but you don't really get deep levels of sedation in most patients with dexmedetomidine. It does go through the liver, so you can get some prolonged duration of action if they have liver impairment, and it's also renally eliminated, but there are no active metabolites. Looking at the dosing, again, I just want this for your reference. You can have some onset, peak, and duration of effect references here uh, if you're curious about that. Uh, as far as going over this in detail, though, I don't want to go through each part of this chart, but just have this in your back pocket or, you know, obviously re uh, referencing some of your reputable drug information sites, LexiComp or Micromedics, this information will be there as well. So in summary, propofol is a great option in both hepatic and renal failure. As we mentioned, although it is hepatically cleared and renally cleared, it also has extra hepatic pathways that eliminate the drug. Uh, some beneficial effects you may see from propofol are also its anticonvulsant effects and the ability to reduce intracranial pressure. So that may make it a, a good option in patients with seizures, status epilepticus, or brain injuries such as uh, tra traumatic brain injury. The big thing with propofol is to watch your hemodynamics. It is a negative inotrope, a negative chronotrope, and it can reduce your blood pressure too. It has uh, direct vasodilatory effects as well. And also, as we've seen with COVID, a lot of these patients get hypertriglyceridemia. Propofol does come in that lipid emulsion, 1.1 kcal per ml. And so each uh, patient who's on propofol should generally get triglyceride monitoring about every 48 hours and being careful to avoid triglycerides greater than 500 due to the risk of pancreatitis. Dexmedetomidine, we mentioned it has that prolonged effect in hepatic failure, and it's a decent option for an adjunct uh, to alcohol withdrawal. Of course, benzodiazepines will still be your primary agent in those patients, but dexmedetomidine can be a good adjunctive agent as well. And as we mentioned with propofol, you also need to watch hemodynamics with dexmedetomidine, primarily with the uh, heart rate as it causes significant bradycardia. And this is why we avoid boluses in adult patients. Pediatrics sometimes are using boluses of dexmedetomidine, but mo most of our adult patients will not tolerate any uh, dexmedetomidine bolus due to the bradycardia that it can cause. Lastly, looking at the benzodiazepines, just remembering some of the clearance differences between these. Lorazepam has the propylene glycol and it is renally eliminated. And then you have to think about the metabolites of midazolam and diazepam. Knowing that benzodiazepines are associated with increased delirium, longer ICU length of stay, longer time on the ventilator, and several randomized controlled trials and retrospective cohort studies, we're generally reserving benzodiazepines for where these other two options are contraindicated. If you have a patient who's significantly hypotensive, uh, maybe propofol is not an option 
for that patient. Or if you have a patient who's significantly bradycardic and hypotensive, you know, maybe you can't do dexmedetomidine. There are several special indications for benzodiazepines, such as alcohol withdrawal, uh, status epilepticus. Though that's really where we're trying to reserve our benzodiazepines most of the time. So I mentioned we'll talk about a couple of the adverse effects of these medications in more detail. Something you'll hear come up uh, as a suspicion sometimes is propofol-related infusion syndrome. It's very, very rare, but it's associated with a high mortality. And when you should suspect this is when patients are on very high doses of propofol uh, for multiple days. So this is typically going to be greater than 60 mics per kilo per minute uh, for two days. And that's generally where these uh, have been reported in those types of patients. And the signs and symptoms, you're going to see a worsening acidosis, high triglycerides, hypotension, arrhythmias, and occasionally you can even see rhabdo, AKI, hyperkalemia, and liver dysfunction. And the reason it can affect all these different organ systems and you basically see uh, multiple organ failure uh, with cardiovascular collapse is that it's primarily thought to be due to mitochondrial dysfunction as the cells uh, in the, the mitochondrial and the mitochondria in the cells are trying to uh, get rid of this uh, fat that you're basically giving from the propofol. And that results in the paired fatty acid oxidation. And so there are uh, proposals that maybe propofol's metabolites are accumulating. They don't really know what causes uh, propofol-related infusion syndrome, but these are just some of the possible mechanisms behind that. And as I said, it's observed uh, following prolonged administration of high doses. Some say greater than 60, some 70 uh, mics per kilo per minute. And currently at Cabell, our max for propofol is 70 mics per kilo per minute. We're actually looking to, in the future, even limiting that down to 60. The, big, the management for propofol-related infusion syndrome is simply to discontinue propofol and provide supportive care. There's no antidote. Uh, you know, you're not going to put these patients on high-dose insulin and reverse this. There's, there's really no specific magic bullet that's going to reverse propofol-related infusion syndrome other than stopping the propofol and then supporting the different organ failures that have resulted from the propofol-related infusion syndrome. Also, we want to talk about hypertriglyceridemia. So this is much more common than propofol-related infusion syndrome. And so triglyceride monitoring while we're on propofol should be obtained. You know, you should get the triglyceride at least before starting propofol or the day of. And then at 72 hours or 48 hour intervals, I think is reasonable. It's not something that you have to monitor every day unless you're having issues with uh, obtaining or getting those high triglycerides and the patient's on a particularly high dose. And so that's what I kind of have indicated here. If you're on more than 50 mics per kilo per minute, the triglycerides are already greater than 300. That may be a situation where you are monitoring it at least daily. If the triglycerides do exceed 500, it's important to consider stopping propofol or setting a, a maximum infusion rate or just using an alternative sedative altogether. The patients that are at risk for pancreatitis when the concentrations exceed 400, uh, but we kind of set a, a limit of 500 just because there is some wiggle room uh, with that data for where the risk of pancreatitis really is. Next, we'll talk about propylene glycol toxicity. As I mentioned, IV uh, lorazepam does contain propylene glycol as a diluent. And some of the signs and symptoms of the toxicity of that propylene glycol uh, accumulating, you're going to see a metabolic acidosis with the elevated uh, anion gap, as well as the elevated osmolal gap. And then uh, acute kidney injury can accompany this or be the cause of the accumulation of the propylene glycol. As I said, it's typically only going to be observed with high doses, 15 to 25 mg per hour, uh, and even for multiple days. So giving a, a dose here or there, PRN, or even limiting your infusion to less than 10 mg per hour uh, per day. I mean, that's that's probably not going to result in propylene glycol toxicity. And it's also something we can monitor for, checking the anion gap, checking serum osmoles, and uh, we can usually prevent that. Serum osmole gap, uh, just remembering that that is going to be the measured serum osmole minus your calculated osmolality uh, using that two times sodium plus glucose divided by 18, plus BUN divided by 2.8. That's, that's typically how we get there. If your osmolal gap is greater than 10 to 12, that's probably indicating some amount of propylene glycol accumulation. So then looking at what do we do if our patients have some kind of acute psychiatric related agitation, uh, you know, hyperactive delirium to the point where they're lashing out, uh, hitting staff, they're harmed to themselves, they're gonna pull their tubes, uh, and when patients are legitimately going to harm themselves or others, 
and they're doing this out of a psychiatric related agitation, that's when a lot of these agents that I have listed on this slide may be beneficial. And I kind of provide this as your reference. One thing you'll note about all the routes of these medications is that they're IM. A lot of the uh, patients who have this acute psychiatric related agitation, they may pull their lines out. They, the nurse may not be able to access an IV line. So it's important to know that a lot of these medications are available IM, and that's typically going to be the preferred route whenever you have a patient uh, acting out due to some kind of psychiatric related agitation. Um, honestly, there's multiple classes that have been studied and multiple comparisons done between these agents for people with psych uh, psychiatric related agitation. And there's not been a lot of difference reported in that literature. So I think honestly, it's it's going to be up to what's going on with that particular patient. What do you have comfortability with as a physician? And uh, what do we have even available in the Pixis machine that the nurse can grab uh, quickly? And so I just provide this slide as a reference uh, with benzodiazepines, some of your typical and atypical antipsychotics, and even ketamine. There's starting to be a little bit of literature for using this for acute psychiatric related agitation. But alternatively, ketamine can also increase agitation in psychiatric related patients. So not many people have been adopting that in practice, although there is starting to be a little bit more literature published, at least retrospective studies uh, regarding ketamine for psychiatric related agitation. All right, so that's kind of a review of the pharmacology. Now I kind of want to get into the evidence base behind why do the guidelines recommend some of the things they do? Why are some of these agents preferred over others? And this is kind of the bulk of the presentation, and I hope to get through as much of the evidence base as possible. I want to kind of start with the end product here. What a lot of the evidence has been pointing to over the years is something called the ABCDEF bundle. And so we'll kind of go through that a little bit, but it, it correlates with pain, agitation, delirium. Each one of these ABCDEF kind of falls within that broader scope of pain, agitation, and delirium. So when we think about those, the symptoms are that patient's in pain, the patient is agitated, the patient is delirious, then we have different monitoring tools for those. So for pain, patients should be monitored with a valid and reliable pain scale. For patients with agitation, they should have you know, a RAS assessment or some other valid sedation scale. And then for delirium, they should have a CAM-ICU or the ICD-SC score to monitor for the development of delirium. And that falls into the care of the patient with the ABCDEF bundle. So A stands for assess, prevent, and manage pain. That's always going to be the first thing that we look at in caring for our patients is assessing, preventing, and managing pain. B stands for both spontaneous awakening and spontaneous breathing trials, so coupling those. And we'll go through the literature a little bit with, with that as well. C stands for the choice of analgesia and sedation. We kind of talked a little bit about that already. It's going to be related to uh, the pharmacology of the drug, what's going on with your particular patient, and what does the evidence base show for those particular agents? D is for delirium, assessing, preventing, and managing. And the last two, early mobility and exercise and family engagement and empowerment. And we'll go through this bundle and what some of the literature has showed regarding the efficacy of the ABCDF bundle. I want to start off with a study that you guys probably even know better than me. E. Wesley Ely, uh, back in the day, I think this was the mid-90s, he conducted a study on the effect of the duration of mechanical ventilation of identifying patients capable of breathing spontaneously. So this is really where the spontaneous breathing trial comes from. And this is was actually conducted where I trained at, at Wake Forest. He was a uh, resident there, and this was his chief resident project at the time. So as I said, 1996, and uh, in the intervention group, what they did is patients underwent a daily screening for respiratory function by the physicians, the RTs, and the nurses to identify those who were capable of breathing spontaneously. Those who had successful tests received two-hour trials of spontaneously breathing, patients who met criteria, and the control subjects only had daily screening, but no other interventions. And you can see there the primary endpoint was the uh, patients receiving mechanical ventilation, and you can see it was drastically reduced in the intervention group uh, with 4.5 days uh, median versus six days. So reduced the duration of mechanical ventilation by day and a half just by doing spontaneous breathing trial on a protocolized basis. They followed that up, JP Kress and colleagues followed that up uh, with daily interruptions of sedative in infusions in critically ill patients undergoing mechanical ventilation. So this set the foundation for spontaneous awakening trials. 
And so in the intervention group in the CREST trial in the year 2000, the sedative infusions were stopped until patients were awake, and they did this every day. In the control group, the infusions were interrupted only at the discretion of the clinicians. So sometimes, you know, we tend to think, uh, you know, our, the clinician discretion beats everything. Well, in trials, doing things on a protocolized daily basis seems to be even the best of the discretion of, of even the best clinicians. So just doing this on a daily basis in the intervention group uh, reduced the duration of mechanical ventilation from 4.9 versus 7.3 days. So almost, you know, uh, two days, over two days, uh, duration of mechanical, mechanical ventilation was shaved off just by doing spontaneous awakening trials. And the length of ICU stay was similarly reduced in the intervention group. And then they said, uh, you know, what if we combine the spontaneous breathing trials and the spontaneous awakening trials? And so uh, Gerard and colleagues, along with J.P. Kress, a lot of these guys' names are on the same studies. E. Wesley Ely is on this study as well. They did a study where they coordinated awakening and breathing and doing these spontaneous breathing trials with the spontaneous awakening trials. And what they found is when they randomly assigned around 300 mechanically ventilated patients to daily awakening trials followed by the breathing trial, or they just did usual care plus the breathing trial as the control group, they again found a reduction in a ventilator, or sorry, an increase in ventilator free days in the intervention group, a reduced time to ICU discharge, and actually one year mortality was favored in the intervention group by pa pairing the spontaneous awakening and breathing trials together. The primary endpoint though was that ventilator free days and that, that was improved in the intervention group. So that's sort of the evidence base for why we do what we do, pairing the cutting off of any sedation they're on with the breathing trial, gets them off the ventilator faster, gets them out of the ICU faster, and may even reduce mortality at one year. And so putting all this together, there's been a lot of uh, nursing-driven studies. So Michelle Ballas is really big on a lot of the literature that's being published now, especially in the nursing world, regarding putting all this together and how does this practically work out. And so they did a study on the awakening, breathing, coordination, delirium monitoring management, and early exercise mobility bundle. So this would be the A, B, C, D, E bundle. The only thing they didn't have was the family empowerment and engagement. And what she looked at is really putting all of this together, the awakening, the breathing, the uh, delirium monitoring, getting the right sedation and the right analgesia on board. Does it really make a difference when you put it all together? And so they did a pre-post study in a facility that didn't do the ABCDE bundle and then followed that up with post ABCDE bundle implementation. And what they found is, as we might expect, is that ventilator free days were improved in patients post ABCDE bundle implementation. Delirium was much less, 62% uh, versus 48% in patients after they got the bundle. And 28 day mortality was reduced again. Remember, these are secondary endpoints. They're more uh, hypothesis generating, but it's still interesting that it's kind of consistent with what you would expect. More time off the vent probably results in less delirium and uh, a reduced mortality. So, just interesting results there that I think that really show the value of this system as a bundle. And another nurse that you'll see published on a lot of this literature, Brenda Pine, they did a study of over 15,000. Uh, adults in the ICU, so quite bigger than the other study we looked at, looking at the ABCDEF bundle. And they really wanted to look at the ABCDEF bundle as a dose-related response. So if you do every element of the bundle versus just part of the bundle, maybe you're good at uh, the spontaneous awakening and breathing trial, but maybe not so much delirium. And so they did complete versus incomplete bundle performance and found that in patients who have complete bundle performance as compared to not, they're more likely to get out of the ICU. They're more likely to get hospital discharge. Death was reduced. Time on the vent, coma, delirium, uh, all these things. Restraint use was reduced. Uh, ICU readmission, discharge destination. So again, all of these things, it makes sense that doing each element of the bundle likely has an additive effect and really complete bundle performance is what we should be shooting for as an institution. They also looked at, uh, you know, what proportion of the ABCDF bundle was completed. So if you had 0%, maybe versus a third of the bundle elements, 0% versus 50, versus 60, versus 80, versus 100. And you could see a dose response. ICU discharge uh, goes up, at more likely for ICU discharge as more elements of this bundle are performed. Hospital discharge goes up as more of the elements are incorporated. And death goes down, and you can see those nice curves where you do have a dose response as more and more 
elements of this bundle are implemented, all of your outcomes that you would expect are going to be improved. Mechanical ventilation, reduced, coma, reduced, delirium, physical restraints, all of those. And the one that I think is kind of interesting in the studies, they actually found maybe a slight trend towards an increase in significant pain. I think that's probably because they're working the patients more, they're getting them up and doing physical therapy more often. The patients are more awake and alert on the ventilator and able to report their pain accurately. And so probably the reason pain was increased is because we're actually doing the right thing for the patient, getting them up out of the bed, moving them around, or at least getting some kind of physical therapy and accurate pain assessment, even while the patients are on the mechanical ventilation. And you can see also that was consistent with readmission and, and uh, facility discharge. So I want to go over this concept of, well, we talked about a now-go sedation, and that's where we use our analgesia as the sedative. And I want to kind of set that foundation for, is there any literature that validates this strategy of using a pain control, control strategy as your sedation? And this started being studied about the year 2010, uh, Strom and colleagues looked at a protocol of no sedation for ICU patients on the ventilator. So this would be no propofol, no benzodiazepines, just an opioid for the control of pain. And so this study was just a single center trial, randomized study of mechanically ventilated ICU patients, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive no sedation versus sedation with daily interruption. What they found was their primary endpoint was uh, median ventilator free days, and that actually was improved in the no sedation a group almost by four days of uh, less ventilation at, at day 28. Secondary endpoints that they looked at, ICU length of stay, as you would expect, would be decreased in the no sedation group. ICU mortality, they found a trend towards a reduction. Again, uh, I would be very cautious interpreting any of those secondary endpoints. And delirium, they actually found was higher in the no sedation group. So I'm not really sure how to explain that other than that we really shouldn't base a lot of conclusions on some of these secondary endpoints. But at least for the clinical application, I'm not even saying this is the strategy that we should uh, take as an institution, but it is interesting to note that some institutions have been successful for this. I do want to note that 18% of uh, patients in the intervention group had some kind of protocol deviation where they did receive sedative infusions. And that's because a lot of these patients were ARDS patients and they probably required a little bit deeper level of sedation than they could get from the opioid alone. So we understand that there's always going to be some patients that have to have a sedative. But it emphasizes the point that, again, we can treat a lot of these people with analgesics first as their sedation before adding on a sedative. Also, they didn't use a CAM ICU or ICDSC to screen for delirium. They used DSM-4 criteria, and that's not something we would commonly be doing here as an institution. So I think we really got to interpret those results uh, with some caution. Propofol also was switched to midazolam at 48 hours, which could influence our results because we know that benzodiazepines prolong ICU length of stay and time on the ventilator. And also this study was done, uh, I think in the Netherlands, where they have a one-to-one -one nursing ratio. It's a single center study. It's an unblinded design, small study size. All of that it limits external validity. So I don't think we should adopt this per se, but I think we can learn something from the fact that we really do need to prioritize pain management first, and that some patients may not require sedation at all. Uh, they repeated this trial and did sort of a bigger study, and this is more recent trial released in New England Journal in 2020, and it's called the non-seda trial. And so they looked at non-sedation versus light sedation in critically ill, mechanically ventilated patients. Also, over overseas one-to-one -one nursing ratios, so we have to remember some of those caveats as well as we interpret this, but I still think we can learn some lessons from this literature. So as we said, this was a multi-center study, so it's going to increase our external validity a little bit more as compared to just that single center study. They randomized them one-to-one, -one, no sedation versus a light sedation strategy, which they defined as RAS of negative two to negative three and daily sedative interruption. And their primary endpoint was 90 a day all-cause mortality. Numerically, it was a slightly higher in the non-sedation group, but there was no difference between group uh, between the groups significantly. And so they kind of hypothesized that maybe the no sedation arm would be favorable towards this endpoint, but there was no difference between the groups. Other interesting endpoints is that major thromboembolism was actually reduced in the no sedation arm. Not really sure how to interpret that other than patients were likely moving around a little bit more. And the days of mechanical ventilation, there was no difference between the groups. So if you think about this study, it's it's I've, 
a kind of a neutral study, not really favoring one group over the other as far as mortality, days on the vent, or anything like that. But I, I think what we can apply is uh, some of the concepts from the study is that several patients decline to participate. So some patients in the ICU are absolutely going to need sedation. We're not arguing that at all. And I think a lot of the patients that were even randomized to participate in this study, they didn't even want to participate because they wanted some kind of sedative uh, while they were in the ICU. And then even those who were in the no sed uh, sedation arm, around 27% of them received some amount of sedative within the first 24 hours. So I don't think it's entirely realistic to only give the patient uh, a pain medication and nothing else. It may work for some patients, but not for everybody. I do think though that many patients were able to tolerate the vent without continuous sedation, and that is a take home point that we can have. There will be some that do not require, you know, prolonged infusions of propofol that's maxed out, prolonged versed for weeks, when we could probably just be getting away with an opioid at least early on. And patients should receive the minimal amount of sedation necessary for comfort. I think that is something we can take away. And I think the standard of care after both of these studies have been published, especially for ICUs in the United States, is going to be now go sedation. When needed, patients can be initiated with light sedation as long as they receive daily interruptions. And so I don't think we need to get rid of propofol and versed altogether, but we do probably need to highlight more of our analgesia as sedation approach and then adding on to sedative only when needed and keeping that at a light level of sedation. So I'll finish up with this slide as we're getting close to time. I, I said I'd probably wrap up around 1245, 1250. I still have quite a bit to discuss in the future regarding delirium and at least the paralytics, and maybe that's what we can finish up on next time I talk to you guys. But I just wanted to provide even more of a rationale for this strategy that we talk about of analgo sedation. A lot of these studies you'll notice uh, have been published throughout the 2000s, and many of them use remifentanil. The reason they're using remifentanil is because it's such a short acting agent and because it's so lipophilic and rapid on and off, it, it, it's such a great agent for this concept of maintaining pain control as well as sedation. But not all the studies looked at remifentanil. Some used fentanyl and then used a stepwise fentanyl approach. So I just want to hit on a couple of highlights of these studies, not going into any of them in too much detail. 2004, Carambinus and colleagues in a neuro ICU trial uh, for patients who required the vent for around one to five days were randomized to receive remifentanil versus uh, fentanyl in a sedative or morphine in a sedative. And the remifentanil group only got a sedative if needed. The big thing they were looking at here is if we cut the sedation and the pain control off, how quickly can we do a neuro assessment and how quickly can we extubate these patients? And as you would expect, Remifentanil being such a short acting agent, the time to neuro assessment was much lower, uh, but even with fentanyl, it was better with morphine. And they had a shorter time to extubation with either remifentanil or a fentanyl plus sedation strategy. Green and colleagues also looked in a, a, a slightly different population with medical or surgical patients requiring mechanical ventilation for more than four days. And their first group was remifentanil with Versed boluses as needed only if they got to almost the max dose of remifentanil. The other group was fentanyl or morphine plus a Versed bolus or infusion strategy from the get-go. So th this is sort of similar to what we do here now is starting both the analgesia and the sedation at the same time. They found that the duration of mechanical ventilation was reduced by uh, 54 hours almost in the remifentanil group. The time to weaning process was much lower. The benzodiazepine requirements were much lower as well, and 26% in the remifentanil arm did not require any sedative at all. Park and colleagues did a single center pre-post study of medical and surgical ICU patients, and in their post group, they used remifentanil and only allowed for Versed or propofol if high doses of remifentanil were, were required. So you can see all these studies are kind of looking at if you're analgesic, you're getting close to the max, patient's still uncomfortable, than adding on a sedative versus just using a hypnotic base regimen from the get go. And they found that in the remifentanil arm, uh, up to almost 40% of the patients did not require any additional sedative hypnotic. And in the others, the profile uh, reduce was uh, lowered and the patients were much more likely to be awake and arousable on mechanical ventilator with just using the analgesia uh, prioritized strategy of remifentanil uh, with PRN versed. Last three studies here quickly, Rosendahl and colleagues primarily looked at a surgery population, and these were patients who they thought would require ventilation for a shorter duration of time. 
And the Remy Fit Mill arm using propofol as needed compared to more of a conventional regimen using both analgesia and sedation from the get-go. They found the extubation was more likely to be early. The weaning times was shorter. ICU discharge was more likely to be uh, occur from day one to three, and the patients had improved sedation and agitation levels. But the two studies I want to really call to your attention, these were not Remy fentanyl studies, but using fentanyl, were the Tedder study in 2014 and FOST in 2016. Both of these studies are similar in that they're pre-post studies almost, or retrospective single center studies. And the Tedder's trial looked at using a fentanyl monotherapy infusion versus propofol infusion as monotherapy, and either group could receive breakthrough opioids or benzoboluses. And what they found was they actually found no difference in time of mechanical ventilation, but found that the pain was much better controlled in the fentanyl infusion arm as patients required much less rescue opioids. And ICU delirium did not differ. So the Tedder study at least shows that maybe there's not a big difference between these arms, but the false study, I think, is probably where we need to go forward in our practice and, and sets a good model for what we might do here at Cabell in the future. And their two arms is were uh, fentanyl as needed. If they were not controlled with that, they would progress to a fentanyl infusion. They still were not controlled. They would add on Versed PRN or propofol or dexmedetomidine infusion. That was their post group. Prior to that, all the patients received propofol plus PRN opioids or an opioid infusion. And that was their pre-group. And you can see they found a beneficial effect on the duration of mechanical ventilation with a reduction of almost a, over a day. The RAS was better controlled uh, in that light sedation range with the fentanyl group. The CPOTs were better controlled in the fentanyl group. And the sedative infusion requirements were much lower in the patients who started off with doing a PRN fentanyl, then going to infusion, then going to PRN sedation arm, as compared to just starting off with sedation from the get-go. I know I covered a lot of data and a lot of concepts in just a short amount of time, uh, but I wanna leave you guys opportunity for questions uh, in the remaining maybe 10 minutes that we have. Thank you guys for your attention. Uh, hi, Nathan, it's Dr. Zaid. Uh, very good talk, I appreciate it. Just a question for you. What do we have in place at Kabul as far as uh, sedation and analgesia protocols and how much are we close to publish guidelines and you know applying these uh, protocols and what's the major barriers that we are not you know following what's already been proven to be working for every other hospital's patients yeah thank you dr zed for that question so i, I think right now we have a pain agitation delirium protocol that we've significantly revised uh dr um uh, so one of the surgery physicians was really big in in getting this going. And um, what we're going to do is try to implement this probably around July. I think probably our biggest barriers, to be honest with you, is uh, nursing hesitation to go away from what we've kind of been comfortable with in the past. Uh, I don't want to put it on any any one party, but as what I've seen trying to advance our, our practices here, it's it's been an uncomfortability adjusting with what they've been taught. And so we are putting together a, a multiple page protocol. It's already been through multiple committees. And I think our biggest uh, thing that we need is better assessments, doing a stepwise approach that follows that protocol. And I think we'll be on target with where we need to be. And so hopefully we can get there by July with the implementation of this. And uh, if you guys have any questions about that protocol, if you'd like me to share it with you individually, I can send that to you. It's quite an extensive document. Uh, but there are a couple of summary pages that I think really highlight what we want to do with a stepwise, accurate assessment, and a protocol-based approach. But I found that you know the titration is a major problem that's not being done, and I'm not sure you know if the nurses you know follow the RAS. Like if there's a RAS score that has to be you know used to titrate your sedation, and when you go for runs and you find your patient extremely sedated you know, too far out, you know, from what, you know, the level of the station should be, you know, based uh, on the RAS. And, uh, and instead of going down on the sedation earlier in the morning or during the night to prepare your patient for the SAT or the SPT, you come in the morning and you'll see increment in the sedation, which will, you know, delay your plans for uh, weaning and, you know, getting the patients into their SAT and SPT. And that 
becomes, you know, a cycle every day and push patients, you know, plans for extubation further and further and putting them at all risk of delayed uh, extubation, you know, the pneumonias and, you know, more need for uh, tracheotomy. Yeah, and I, I, I share those observations as well. Um, currently, they don't have a validated pain assessment scale that they use at all, and they're primarily doing everything based on the RAS. Last time I did a chart review of just looking at the RASs for all of our patients, they're, they're all documented at negative two universally, whether the patient's, uh, you know, pulling at tubes and agitated or whether they're completely obtunded. So I, I totally agree with you. I don't know how well the, uh, the titrations are being followed. I think what implementing this protocol going forward will do for us in the future is really holding people accountable and, and showing them that, you know, this is what the protocol says. This is when you're supposed to cut sedation off. This is how you're supposed to titrate, and that's not being done. Right now, I don't know if we we really can hold them to accountable because there's not something concrete, but we're moving towards that in the future. And uh, yeah. thank you for your input, Dr. Sim. Yeah, we have many, many new patient uh, nurses, you know, in the ICU right now. I feel that, and again, I'm not going to blame it totally on the nursing, but I feel that, you know, more in servicing, you know, for the newer staff would be important. So to gear everyone to be you know, on board with the uh, protocol and trying to implement and enforce the protocol. But yeah. thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. Hey, Nathan, thank you for the lecture. Two questions. Uh, wait, let's mute here. So um, uh, the first question is, uh, did we create a ketamine infusion uh, protocol? And the second question is, um, uh, th this um, uh, sedation, uh, this analgo sedation, if, if we are to implement the FOST analgo sedation, Protocol, and I know we talked about that earlier when we were talking uh, in, during the in the PAD committee. But if we start, some, if we intubate someone in severe ARDS or something, we need to have a pathway where we um, um, bypass the initial fentanyl PRN, midazolam PRN, um, uh, unless if that is very short lived. So you try fentanyl for one hour. Sometimes you can't even wait one hour. Okay, so I, I just need to have a. Um, I think it will be better served if we have like uh, the patient is in severe RDS pathway so that we don't have the nurses confused because we can't if we have one protocol and the nurses are following it we can't keep breaking like let's say we have COVID now so then we will have well not just severe COVID it has to be ARDS in general and not even paralytics right so I saw that but but it has to be uh, severe ARDS we should have a different pathway this way this way the nurses will not have like they will say okay well we're not going to use the protocol doctors keep breaking the protocol right yeah yeah i think um to so to answer the first question with the ketamine we do have an order built for that now uh it is available to be ordered uh what we're going forward with at the next pnt uh the last critical care we discussed potential um uh, what do you call it restrictions for ketamine and so those went through critical care and we'll be bringing those uh, through PNT. And it's a lot of the things I mentioned, like if they're having an active in STEMI, that's not going to be someone you want to start on ketamine. Or if you're, uh, you know, you're not maxed out on other agents, maybe uh, ketamine is not going to be an appropriate agent. So that'll be going through uh, PNT, those uh, restriction criteria this month. For the second question regarding ARDS, I think, yeah, this is going to be optional uh, for physicians to order the new pad protocol or to do sort of what they would like to do, especially if you're requiring deep sedation for ARDS, that's going to be a patient that you're not necessarily wanting to use the new pad protocol in. And I think, like you said, it's going to require a lot of uh, nursing education of how you're going to approach the, the new pad protocol patients. And then you have the deeply sedated and paralyzed patients. Those are going to be a, a different a different beast to deal with, especially if we're dealing with more COVID. But the intention is to not start off with PRN fentanyl in, in like a severe COVID or severe ARDS, as you mentioned. Yeah. 
anyone else has questions, guys, for Nathan? I think we are done. Thank you, Nathan, so much for this great presentation. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate your time. Thank you.